like to give the floor to our sp uh, first sponsor, uh, Mr. Molten. Uh, you have the floor. Please uh, give us your perspective. Thank you very much. I have a few slides. Oh, I can share them. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be here. And what I will do is try to, to give kind of a more overall perspective and to understand where I come from, just the two words on my organization, IC Permit. We are an organization who is trying to coordinate and promote all aspects related to personalized medicine over the full value chain in order to, to get to the end point where we, where we have uh, personalized medicine as an integral part of our of our healthcare. What's important to understand is that our organization consists of funders, public funders, not for profit, private funders, and also decision makers in healthcare. For example, research health ministries, for example. So what we do is to have internal discussions in order to try to align investments, for example, within personalized medicine. And we also do a number of different events and publications in order to promote uh, personalized medicine. And we have been into business for more than six years now. What we also do is to try to follow what's going on in personalized medicine and where are kind of the key points where we really should have a focus right now. And it is, this is one of the things that we also discuss with our members so that they can direct and target different efforts in the area. And if you take a look at the personalized medicine landscape, you all know this, there has been a lot of development over the last 10 years. So it started out as kind of a very early stage research thing around genomics particularly. And then it has developed now until we actually starting to see implementation of personalized approaches in healthcare systems. So there has been a lot of development and that's really good. And we are now also starting to talk about personalized prevention, which is a very interesting concept. And we will see how the kind of the world develops uh, when going forward. But how far are we then in, in reaching kind of the full vision of personalized medicine? <clears throat> and as I said, we have moved quite a lot, but in some ways we are still at a rather early stage. And well, I can talk a lot, of, a lot about different issues here, but my limited time taking in conservation, I will just focus on, on a few things here. One thing is on research innovation, I'll get back to that. But then there are also, as the, the area has developed and we are going down the value chain and starting to implement, we're starting to see other issues coming up. That's one thing about data. I will also come back to that in a separate slide. But there are also aspects as uh, <clears throat> uh, HTA and health economics. How can we afford this? How can we handle kind of have a sustainable health care and still include these opportunities for the patients and the citizens? And then also there's a whole structure of our healthcare systems in order to fully accommodate health uh, personalized medicine approaches. There are a need for a number of, of different uh, revolutions, I would call them, within healthcare. And all of these three things are very much today depending on policy. And let me just talk, I just heard the last part of the discussion in the previous panel, and I feel that was very close to my heart, because I cannot talk about this without also talk about data access and data sharing. Because in all parts of personalized medicine, you need data. And nonetheless, if you talk about pharmacodynamics and pharmacogenetics, definitely you can't do anything without data. And the data you need is also getting broader and broader. So it's no longer just genomic data, it's also healthcare data. And going forward, there's also the concept of real world data and data coming directly from the patients via apps and so on that will be critically needed in order to develop uh, the area. And we all know there's a lot of issues around ethics and legal aspects and so on and so on. And we have struggled with this for years. And there are now some good initiatives uh, to trying to solve these things. But 
I heard in the last comment in, in the previous session was we need to collaborate. And I fully agree on that. But I think the main change now is that where personalized medicine up till now has been a bottom up process, there is now a need for a top down actions. Because the only ones who can solve the data pro the problem we have in data access and data sharing are the politicians. Finland, for example, have started already to, to do some, some implementation of some legal frameworks, which makes it possible. We need, but we need that, that a more broader aspect. And I certainly hope that the new European health data space will help solve this issue. Then there's the issue about research and innovation within personalized medicine. And as I said, it, it has been developed, but for good reason, it started out mainly with cancer and then spread out to rare diseases. And that's kind of natural because these are the diseases where you're in the, should have easy is the wrong word, but it's where you can find the most direct link between the disease pathologies and, and genetic defects. But in order to truly get into a healthcare system where we really benefit from personalized medicine, we have to go into the, the other major diseases. And they are unfortunately much more difficult to approach from a personalized perspective. So, so we need to develop new peer-based treatments uh, and therapies in all diseases. And I think also, for example, if you talk about pharmacogenomics, a problem which is not, in my opinion, sufficiently addressed is the access to the necessary drugs, the necessary treatments. Um, and I, I often hear refer to, or we can just repurpose all the drugs we already have. In my opinion, that will not be in, sufficient in order to develop it. And this is where we really need a public-private partnership approach to a much larger extent, because we need to pool the resources from research, academic research, and to also take all the strength from the industry who can take the research results and make them into useful treatments for the patients. So there's still a lot of things uh, to do here. And I think I will uh, stop here because I don't have so much time and maybe just mention uh, that there's an upcoming opportunity that under the new Horizon Europe that will be coming a new European partnership for personalized medicine. And I have no time to go into detail, but just have this in mind because this partnership will probably have a more than 300 million euros available for projects and developments within personalized medicine over the next seven years. So there will be opportunities here for getting funding for relevant projects. So with this, I would just say thanks for your attention. <clears throat> uh, I see permit, uh, let's say on uh, international European level, um, how do you see uh, the, let's say, uh, a local implementation of uh, of your uh, global efforts? Uh, are we uh, still uh, far from that, or uh, what do you see as bottlenecks to to let's say implement those uh, policies policies and recommendations locally in different territories? Maybe here with you. Yeah. I mean, it, there are different a number of different perspectives. I mean, one thing is in order to to make it work at all. I think kind of there, as I mentioned. I mean, we have the data problem. I mean, we have it. This really an issue. When I talk to projects of all sorts, all places, early stage research, clinical research, implementation activities, people always complain about they cannot get the necessary data in order to do the best possible thing here. And this is where I kind of, I think the at policy level, there needs to be made, as I said, some legal frameworks. And there is a little bit of a, I will call it a scare among politicians. For example, every time I hear a politician at meetings talking about personalized medicine, they all think it's a good idea, but the first thing they say 
we need to handle data in a secure way that kind of makes sure that we have privacy for the data owners, the patients and the citizens and so on. And that is all true. I definitely don't disagree with that. We need to solve that problem. But they don't start out by saying personalized medicine is a huge opportunity for patients and citizens to get a better health care. And in order to get there, we need to solve some problems. So you follow my thinking here. It's, yeah. it's, it's there's kind of too much, too much uh, respect, you might call it, for, for these legal and ethical issues. And the interesting thing is, and we also heard that from, from the last session, if you go out and talk to the patients and the citizens, most of them in the surveys that have been made, and that's quite a few, they will actually be happy to to share their data. So so there's, uh, there's definitely one bottleneck there that kind of needs to, to, to be resolved. Then there's uh, the other major bottleneck, which is starting to come up, is how can we afford it? Oh. And there we need to go into completely different healthcare models. So the current classical reimbursement model will not work anymore because it's not taking the full perspective into play. And to say, it, I mean, this is a very long story, but to make it very short, you might say the current healthcare models or health, the current health economics model, they look at a specific treatment, or what does that cost on an isolated, from an isolated point of view, and compare it with a classical treatment. And then go say, okay, this is much more expensive. We cannot afford that. We need to go back to the classical treatment. What the problem is with the current health economic models and reimbursement models, they don't take the longer perspective into play. So if you can really make a difference for a patient, going from being a patient to a citizen, then there will, there will, the perspective will be completely different. And you need to take kind of these things into account. And then the question of cost becomes very different. Because then maybe at one instant in time, there will be a heavy cost. But over time, because the treatment are so much better, the society will gain a lot. Maybe here it's a matter of understanding that costs uh, similar to uh, genomic data is highly contextual. So uh, in order to really understand it, you have to have the full context and the full picture. Exactly, exactly. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, move to Dr. Dunenberger. You have the word. Uh, thank you. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes, perfectly. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, happy to share the floor with uh, this panel. Uh, some of you guys I've presented with before, so it's good to see you again. Um, I work for a health system in uh, the United States, uh, just on the northern suburbs of Chicago. Uh, we're a community-based health system that has been implementing pharmacogenomics for about eight years now. Uh, we have 20,000 plus patients with multi-gene uh, pharmacogenomic panels embedded in the medical record with clinical decision support. Um, and while I'm not going to share any data today about what we've done with that clinical decision support, uh, I'm going to use that as a framework to discuss where uh, I think the field really needs to move and, and have some innovation so that we can uh, maximize uh, the benefit of personalized medicine and specifically pharmacogenomics. The other caveat I will give here is uh, when I'm thinking and talking about pharmacogenomics, I'm wholly talking about germline pharmacogenomics, uh, not somatic variation uh, and say the cancer space to pick uh, targeted agents. So a uh, title of my slides here are just uh, unlocking the value of pharmacogenomics across time and space, the role of clinical decision support. Um, so I was lucky to work with some collaborators in uh, 2020, 2021 uh, to publish a how-to and a review article on 
clinical decision support for pharmacogenomics. And we came up with this uh, diagram to really show, well, where are all the places in the care journey for the patient uh, where pharmacogenomic clinical decision support could be utilized and is utilized based in the literature. And so what you're seeing on this uh, slide is basically that journey from uh, some early point in time all the way on the left to some future point in time all the way on the right. The red line in the middle is the moment that you're ordering pharmacogenomic testing. Uh, the line in the middle is telling you kind of what's the event that's occurring. And then the hexagons that are in blue or orange are showing you the clinical decision support tools that have been used and who they're facing. And so the blue is provider facing and the orange is patient facing. So when you look at this, there should be a striking uh, difference. And that is there are very few orange hexagons on the screen, but a lot of blue hexagons. Uh, and so the takeaway here is that we have done a lot of work as a field to figure out how to contextualize pharmacogenomic data for the provider and allow the provider to control that information uh, to date. What uh, we haven't done so much of is figure out how and when we should deliver pharmacogenomic data to the patient so that they can have some ownership. Um, with the kind of blue clinical decision support here at North Shore, patients have had results in their record for more than five years, and it's triggering clinical decision support to improve their care today. Um, and on average at our institution, uh, patients have about a three year longevity of pharmacogenomics being in the record and firing clinical decision support, meaning the results were done three years ago, lab result done three years ago, impacting care today, uh, which is something very unique about genetics. And then we definitely have evidence to show that. But what would be interesting to me and something that I'm probably gonna work with my team to do is go ask those patients three years later, if they've had pharmacogenomic testing done. Because I think because of our absence of clinical decision support, patients no longer remember that they had this lab test done three years ago because most medical lab tests that they do, they may remember it for a very short period of time. But after that, there isn't a lot of need to know it for many years over their care. And I'm about to explain to you why I think we need to know it on their care. Um, this discussion piggies back really well into the previous discussion with rare disease and talking about patient ownership of data and patient understanding of data. Uh, it gets into some of Einer's comments about uh, data sharing and data regulation and how we get this done. These are all hurdles that we have to come across, but ultimately this is our patient's data and we need to give it into their hands um, in a meaningful manner in the mode that they prefer and at the time that they want. Um, and that's really the challenge we have in front of us. So why is it so important that across the patient journey, we get, uh, we get our data in our patient's hands and let them understand it? Well, if you look in the literature, what you see here are types of value that have been reported for pharmacogenomics uh, from a number of different studies. And so, you see some of the classic ones that everybody thinks about, increased medication effectiveness, avoidance of adverse events, um, guidance in making new medication decisions, decreased medication costs, decreased medication odysseys, um, all of those things. But what I've highlighted here are five, and those are mutual informed decision-making, increased patient autonomy, increased patient satisfaction, increased adherence and compliance to treatments, including medications, psychological reassurance. These are all patient-centric and patient-driven values of pharmacogenomics that have been reported in the literature, and at least on number uh, represent at least half of the types of value that have been reported in the literature. So if the value of pharmacogenomics is at least a large minority driven by patient focused uh, attributes, we have to give our patients pharmacogenomic data throughout their life in a meaningful way to them and not their providers. Otherwise, 
we will miss out on this value. And to a point that Einer made, right, we have to worry about cost. But when you think about cost, you have to think about the value that that cost is delivering. And if you're missing out on half of the value that it's delivering based on the modality that you're presenting that data in, then you will never be able to justify the cost. Or you will always lose the cost argument because you've missed a large piece of that pie. And so because this is the value that has been reported in the literature from both studies and real world evidence, we have to deliver clinical decision support that meets this need, right? gets it to patients in the manner that they want to have it at the time that they want to have it. And there have been some great efforts in getting this done, uh, thinking about the UPGX project specifically and creating a medication card to give patients. But that's just one modality that may or may not work across uh, the needs of all patients. I've We have asked our patients about that in Chicago and they're not very excited about that modality. So what else can we do as a field uh, to move this forward. And so just to drive this point home further, if this is the CDS landscape, how do we deliver on that value? So on the left here, you have physician or clinician facing CDS and all of the modalities that we use. And on the right, you have the patient. And again, you see this massive imbalance between what we do for providers and clinicians and what we do for patients. It is our challenge and our charge <coughs> to in 10 years, show you this same diagram, but have it maybe even be unbalanced to the patient side, because that's how we're going to deliver on pharmacogenomic value going forward. Especially if we don't tackle something else that Einer brought up, which is developing uh, therapeutics that can leverage genomic data in private partner, or, yeah, private public partnerships, because if we're trying to provide precision on drugs that were developed in a non-precision environment, older drugs, things that were developed in the 90s, 80s, 70s, adding precision there may not actually matter because you don't have that ability. It's like taking a TV transmission from the 1950s and putting it on a 4K and 8K TV. It might not be that good, even though the technology driving it is inherently better. Those are challenges that we have faced ourselves as we move forward in pharmacogenomics. So with that, I'll uh, stop sharing my slides and then I'll pause, take some questions and get ready for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dornberger. Um, I actually, I'm curious to, uh, to know, uh, do you think that uh, th this, let's say, highlighting the patient-centric approach and focusing on that also could benefit from uh, providing uh, uh, extra concepts uh, back to the back to the providers about what the uh, long-term experience of patients uh, is uh, with the therapy and uh, uh, let's say uh, building a, 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 a more thorough picture uh, uh, with the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, effectiveness and experiences and everything that the patient, uh, let's say, throughout the e years following the, the first uh, um, therapy is uh, actually living through and experiencing. Yeah, I mean, I think it could definitely help, right? So one of the problems that we have in healthcare today is the data that we have and the data that we present to providers is almost wholly focused on what happens inside of four walls of whether it's a four walls of a hospital, four walls of an office visit. And we rarely have the data on what happens outside of those four walls. We're starting to get it with wearable data, but that's um, kind of limited to certain things that you could monitor. And we also have another challenge as providers and clinicians that we don't always trust what our patient tells us, right? So our patient could tell us they've had a really bad experience with a medication, but we're not there listening to that and ready to accept that as the truth. We think they're just making it up, right? And so we have to open up that discussion. And one way to do that, right, is through data sharing and understanding maybe in a structured manner, what is happening outside of our four walls of whatever healthcare context we're in. I think that's hugely important as we move forward. 
And that's going to generate more data, which means more security and more data transfer that we're all going to have to agree to. But we don't have enough data to understand the full context of our patient today to really deliver on the promises we've all we all believe and talk about with precision medicine. So coming up with ways of better defining the patient experience and delivering that back to providers is definitely incredibly important in this space. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good. So now I suggest to proceed uh, uh, with. Can I? Can I so, sorry. Yes. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, um, I had a question for Mark. Um, Absolutely. I, I didn't ahead. quite because I'm a cancer researcher, and of course, a, a lot of focus in our in our research is on uh, sequencing tumors and um, identifying private mutations. But in the case of um, General pharmacogenetics, the big advantage is that genotypes are just ascertained once, and there they are. Um, I didn't quite uh, catch in your pipeline where exactly uh, did they come? I mean, would it be that at every uh, visit to the doctor, a new genotyping test is prescribed and made, or, or is it that people have their profile and it's in their own card and they bring it in? So at our institution, we store the genetic data in our medical record in a way that it's accessible by both patients and providers. And so mm -hmm. we have more than 25,000 patients mm -hmm. with these discrete data in their record, and they're utilized over and over and over again throughout their care, not only in the clinical setting where the testing was done, but across any clinical setting that a patient might come to. So. Uh, a lot of our testing gets done at primary care during the annual physical. It's like a preventative health visit. So the idea of getting this data at that visit makes sense because we're going to improve on your health in the future. And then that data can be used by their psychiatrist that's in our institution or their cardiologist. Or if you come in to have a surgery, let's say you uh, have to have a total knee replacement, we have that data there to drive your pain management after uh, that treatment. It's all embedded and supported through clinical decision support. Uh, but what we have to do is empower the patient to know that that state is there and mm -hmm. that their medication decisions that were made mutually with their provider were at least informed by that genetic data. And because these test results were three, four, five years old, patients may not remember that they even exist, right? And mm -hmm. so we have to deliver clinical decision support to remind the patient that there is this really valuable thing they did five years ago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in healthcare. Can I can I be allowed to make a comment here also? Because yes, I think, yes, sure. I think you're touching on a very important point here, because as it is in general today, when patient patients' data are not generally available, so it could be excellent. As you say, if you have a genotyping done for specific patients, and then 10 years later, the same patient comes with a completely different disease, and can then one can go back and look in, into these data and see what we can learn from that. This infrastructure is not available today in our healthcare system, at least not in Europe and in, also in many other places. And another very important point, in my opinion, is if you the area we're touching on today with precision medicine or personalized medicine is is mainly in in secondary or tertiary care. The real problem, we will, the real benefit will come if we can implement personalized medicine in primary care with the GPs. But we don't have the infrastructure to do that. Because if you take your own field, Vasily, it's within cancer, for example, that's all going on within kind of the cancer community. And you know what we are talking about when we are talking about genetic reasons for, for different cancers and so on. If you go to the DP, and this is where I mentioned, if you go into the other big diseases, cardiovascular, pulmonary, whatever, they are mainly being handled in primary care by the DPs. And in that setting, we are very far from really implementing all the benefits of personalized medicine and precision medicine. So we need a lot of new infrastructure if you want to implement that kind of thing in there. And that kind of links to the thing here about access to old data, access to, to other kinds of data, which is important here. 
Sorry, I couldn't help it. It's one of my pet projects. Pet topics. No, I, I think this is a very interesting comment, and I, I think I could even say something maybe useful in that respect. In Norway, we have a centralized prescription uh, system. So every doctor prescribes every prescription goes through a common computer system, and it's based on the personal number of a, of, the, of a person. So we had this initiative to actually incorporate pharmacogenomics data into this prescription system, which will remind, if not the patient, at least the doctors, what kind of genetic background this patient would have every time they prescribe the next pain-killing drug or, or, or other drug. But uh, we hit on a wall there. It wasn't, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it, it, sound, it seemed like a very good idea, uh, but there are some uh, issues that, um, didn't allow us to to bring that. And that was which exactly information should go in, where is the threshold of, uh, of actionable uh, uh, genotype, um, these kind of things. So even if the infrastructure is in place, it's still not um, easy to implement. I will I will share one comment and then we'll, then I'm happy to move on to the next uh, speaker. But so this kind of exact thing where we were identifying interactions, right? We took it one step further and said, okay, the system can identify the interaction, but if we have a clinician and we present that to them, and this uh, data is under review right now, only about 25% of those interactions were then clinically relevant to the patient's care at that moment in time, meaning that the prescription when it was flagged, uh, it's only going to last for a couple of more days, things like that, or the patient had been on it for a very long time and uh, we're, we're quite stable on it, and so interfering may not be worthwhile. So just because an interaction exists and you build a system to identify the interaction, it doesn't solve the patient care problem. Uh, and so there's a human touch that you have to figure out into your systems, and, and that's really a challenge that we have uh, today and, and, and going forward. So. I think the, the human touch is... Uh... At the same time, um, beautiful, but also uh, problematic a little bit. So um, we have a lot to think about. Good. If so, I can, yeah. If I can have a comment about yes, data yes, sharing really. about uh, how pharmacogenomics is it's very important about cancer patients and about how society. Uh, that we all know the exact prevalence of uh, some genes or some uh, mutations because that's uh, the way the system and the society can address the funds for uh, more um, <laughs> uh, to address funds for more uh, drugs for uh, these mutations for these patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. So actually, uh, um, our next uh, speaker is Professor Christensen, uh, who will also uh, touch on the on the topic of oncology, as well as Dr. Relief, who is also active medical oncologist. So, uh, Professor Christensen. Interesting to to hear what you have to say about molecular and mathematical models to help us all figure it out a little bit better. Maybe. Oh, thank you, thank you. I don't have my share button active. I don't know why. Maybe um, Gergana the, the or hosts, Monica could share my will do, will, yeah, will would share so. my my slides. I I somehow Peter, just before. Just, just just a second because we have an issue with the platform and we're trying to solve it. So just a oh. few minutes. Yeah, sorry. I'm I'm just glad we're to hear my fault to, this time. We're we're not able to, to switch the roles to present a mode. Ah, oh. maybe that has to do with that I cannot share. No, no, it's 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 about it's with the platform, it's not you. So just <laughs> one or two minutes. I also cannot uh... Uh, 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 use my sharing function, but uh, if I am able to share somehow, 
I also have the slide deck of uh, No, only yeah. Monica, who is the host, is able to change the roles, but she has some technical issues with her computer and the platform. So one or two minutes and we will give you a sign when you're able to share. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, I could start without slides, uh, then giving sure, my yeah. background. Yes, sure, um, please. I, um, I'm a molecular biologist. Um, I'm a, a director of research of the Department of Medical Genetics. Uh, 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 hello. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I'm to interrupt you, Professor, but uh, I just want to address the uh, hosts and our support team to mute themselves because we are hearing them. Thank you. Please go ahead, Dr. Christensen. Sorry for the interruption. Yes. So, and our Department of Medical Genetics provides medical services to 60% uh, of the Norwegian population uh, for everything which has, which come, which starts with Mendelian uh, diseases, uh, prenatal and neonatal diagnostics, um, hereditary cancers, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, um, and uh, bipolar diseases, and um, uh, um, infectious diseases. So basically, we are the Department of Genetics, um, and uh, my my own speciality, and I'm a cancer researcher, and I will then speak more like a, like a, my my perspective will be more like of a scientist i heard that most of the discussion was very much going around the idea of implementation on cost benefit stakeholders how to convince the community uh, that what we do what we do is correct and and useful but also uh, my field is very much uh, concerned with how to improve our own discovery success rate because um, I'm now reading a very interesting book written written by a medical oncologist, um, Azra Raza, on uh, um, uh, it's called the first cell. If everybody's anybody, it's, it's just about how we cure cancer and and um, why why do we cure cancer at such a late and catastrophic stage, and and uh, why is it so that basically of all these precision medicine um, initiatives. Um, there are no more than 30% of the patients who have actionable mutations uh, to which there are no known actionable targets. And of these 30%, there's still 10% that actually respond the way one would uh, expect them to respond based on their based on their molecular profiles. So, so this is outside the, the, the scientific community. This would be considered as a very low success rate. So, so how can we uh, do to improve uh, our, our discovery? Uh, and one initiative they, they, that we had, which I thought was relevant to this discussion, was a, a Horizon 2020 project, which I coordinate and which comes from uh, many uh, different countries. Are my slides moving uh, automatically or uh, no. uh, by some decision? Professor Christensen, we just set up your presentation and we're going to change slides under your navigation. So Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So this is an illustratory, like the, the number of decisions that both patients need to take. This is on the left panel, like uh, we all have had this ourselves or had had members of our families with whom we had to discuss all aspects of an oncological treatment when it comes to what it takes, how long it takes, how does it fit everything else that happens in my life, which is of course uh, quite, uh, um, quite a burden on the, on the patient side. On the medical side, on the left panel, we have all these combinations of drugs which are increasing exponentially uh, and uh, which uh, also a, a, a medical doctor needs to make decisions about, especially in the cases which are outside the given guidelines for a given treatment. So basically, we uh, do design studies that test different combinations and eventually can help uh, clinicians and patients make their choice based on that. So let's see on the, what's on the next slide. 
Yes, so this is our consortium. So so we are a number of scientists from Norway, Germany, Sweden, the United Kingdom, uh, based on different uh, uh, different uh, expertise, starting from from top uh, left. Uh, first of all, of course, it's every, everything is based on the clinical collaborators who are designing and conducting the clinical trials. These are both people uh, in Norway, where I uh, where I work, but also in Germany and in Spain. And these are all breast cancer oncologists. So we have a team of uh, uh, molecular biologists, which is the second. Do you see my cursor when I move it? No, no. Unfortunately, the cursor is. Uh, no, that's okay. I'm still on the previous uh, slide, uh, with, uh, darling. Yeah, let's go back. back. Yes. No, we are at the very end now. Yes. So, so, so in the in the. Uh, this molecular uh, biology team, we do extract uh, uh, omics data from the patients in the clinical trials where the different treatment responses are compared. We do that at uh, general omics level, but we also do that at a single cell level. And then a lot of data generated in a, in a data management uh, and bioinformatics uh, uh, work package, which are then uh, introduced into the mechanistic modeling and prediction of tumors. So basically, we have collected something like our consortium have something like 12,000 patients organized in several different clinical trials. And uh, these we, in a way, our aim is to create sort of uh, digital twins of the tumors of these patients, which we can then treat over and over again and make predictions about what uh, treatments uh, could have worked better. So basically, the, the idea being, uh, maybe next slide now, that when we generate all these data, so for instance, in this clinical trial, this is a pretty clan, clan, uh, uh, classical setup where we have a study population that is divided, randomized into classical chemotherapy on the left arm or chemotherapy with targeted therapy. And then we do uh, uh, conduct this kind of uh, time course studies where we take a biopsy at diagnosis and then after the first series of treatment and then after the second line of treatment. And then we compare uh, uh, the, the responses, right? I mean, and we compare the responses to um, classical, retinological, or MRI, or shrinkage of the tumor, because the, these, this is in an adjuvant setting. Then, in addition, the next one, what we could do uh, is, um, or maybe we can move forward. Um, exactly. So, we can then, out of this, we can generate genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics profiles, and that's what we do. And then we see in uh, in a network fashion which of these uh, uh, pathways in each tumors are abrogated, which correspond to known actionable targets. We have a full list of actionable targets and the drugs that can be uh, used to address uh, this uh, uh, weakness of the tumor or hopefully discover new. And one, one uh, opportunity for new discovery is the next uh, slide. Um, a method, um, so in, in addition to doing all these molecular studies, we try from each tumor, this is also a clinical trial, uh, which in which we try to create this kind of uh, primary uh, 3D cultures, organoid cultures of this tumor. So we can then uh, uh, experimentally, while the patient is under treatment, we can treat these little org organoids with the same treatment and see whether or not they can be used to eventually predict responses. So if, if for instance, like in this clinical trial, this is a hormonal treatment, a clinician can start with uh, eczema stain or with letrozole and uh, there are patients for, for whom the one combination is better and the others uh, and, and not the other. And they, this, this, you, you don't know this upfront. So these experiments could help the uh, clinic decision making in that in that sense. Then uh, next slide too, um, uh, uh, another uh, technique for new discovery, very potent today, is single cell sequencing. These tumors are also subjected to that. And you can see that of all the cells in the tumor, you can have this uh, uh, distribution in space and also colored by different cell types, which can also be seen how they develop under treatment. So at the very, very right one panel, you can see the T cells, the B cells, the epithelial cells, part of which, uh, majority of which are actually tumor cells. Uh, and macrophages, and we can see how these uh, uh, cell populations develop with treatment, and eventually which are the cell populations which remain as a determinant of, of resistance. Next slide, please. 
then this, of course, generates a huge amount of data, both experimentally. Uh, this turns very quickly into information science or data science, um, because we try then again to summarize and synthesize this information into um, uh, meaningful, uh, actionable targets. Next slide. And we follow this pipeline then from uh, from uh, from the cancer patient with uh, uh, personal clinical data, which are collected for 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 our patients. Both everything that is taken in the hospital as part of the clinical routine, but also uh, the omics data that we generate in our consortium. And then, based on what we know about the mechanism of actions of these drugs, uh, we create these mechanistic mathematical models, which then help us to see, as you see in computer simulations, now we can put all these parameters of a tumor for all 12,000 tumors in, 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 in subject them to computer simulations. And we know what the real truth is. We know what the patient got and how did the patient respond. But we also can test in these computer simulations if I then say that I can take all the tumors with these molecular characteristics, I divide them in two into a training set and a discovery set, and then on my training set, I do different predictions about if I had given this drug in a, in a different dosage, in a different gauge, or or uh, in different combinations, would I have eradicated more tumor cells, which are these black dots uh, in this uh, in in these uh, four different uh, um, pictures uh, above where it says digital twin. So I can count tumor cells in that, and then I can um, suggest some. Um, uh, options for optimal treatment. That must be my concluding slide, I think. It may, what do I have more? Yes. So, so this summarizes in a way the consortium in, in this little pyramid in the bottom here are all the clinical trials from the different uh, centers in Europe. Um, the uh, clinical collaborators who are very important part of this because they are on top of what is the clinical practice and what trials make sense to conduct based on their own experience. And basically our project doesn't have a goal, anything else, but in a way to summarize this experience and maybe uh, use machine learning and uh, more advanced computer science uh, techniques into summarizing this experience, which, which MDs actually all the time uh, exchange uh, nonetheless. And, and then these molecular data are, are uh, collected and analyzed together, and we hope to identify new uh, barcodes. This barcode in the top uh, needs to bring some new pharmacogenomics uh, barcodes for for treatment response for each patient. That is that is there more slides? <laughs> Yeah, that is our consortium. This is from our first meeting in uh, Oslo just before the lockdown in 2020. But we have been quite, um, quite um, successful moving even uh, in difficult times. And um, hopefully uh, we can bring some new signatures of response that may be useful. We all hope so, Professor. And uh, I do have actually one question for you, but I will keep it for later because I want to make sure that we uh, also give enough time to Dr. Relief. And then uh, uh, if uh, you are uh, still here and happy to answer, I will ask you. Of course. Good. Thank you very much for the exciting uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Iliev. I give the floor to you, and it would be very interesting to know from yeah. the perspective of a uh, doctor being there right next to the patients. Uh, what is your own experience with uh, uh, with pharmacogenomics techniques in uh, from practical point of view? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a medical oncologist, and uh, my presentation will show you how the um, science can come to the patient. So, uh, what can we do with our patients with novelties in pharmacogenomics? Uh, it's very important in cancer treatment that we have two genomes. One is genome of the person with cancer. This is germline genome and genome of the malignant tumor, the somatic genome. Uh, most of our tests are done on the genome of the malignant tumor, and we use them as base for the treatment. Uh, just in those few exceptions, we can use uh, sometimes germline genome. 
and uh, the data that we access from the genome are used for precision medicine. All the tests that are done for different biological markers in cancer, we can use for established diagnosis, for prognosis, and also for monitoring of the progression. For now, there are more than 50 cancer therapies which require genomic testing, and even more, uh, we have several, I think seven uh, FDA-approved tests that works on liquid biopsy. The most uh, often used are EGFR, ALK, and BRCA tests. Also, we use so-called pan-cancer markers and tracked an MSA, which are markers uh, agnostic from the tumor. We treat patients with these markers independently of the origin of the tumor. The most uh, often used uh, method, methods of analysis are immune histochemistry, in situ stabilization, PCR, and NGS. Next very important issue is comprehensive genomic profiling. It's very important because most of the approved drugs work on a detection of single viral markers. But with improvement in NGS and proteomics, we can provide a broader genomic analysis. And the very important question is when to perform tumor comprehensive genomic profiling. We can do that at time of diagnosis. We can do that at time of progression, maybe for difficult to treat cases or as a salvage therapy. This is important question. And uh, for every point of uh, time point of uh, performing tumor CGP, we have pro and cons. And maybe it's a topic to discuss with the panel later. On this slide, I can share some experience from our center. This is the most commonly used biomarkers. Most of them are, are tested on somatic genome of, of the tumor genome. HER2 HER for breast and gastric cancer, EGFR for lung cancer, PDL also for lung cancer. These uh, four markers are widely used, hundreds of patients, also RAS for the colon cancer. The other markers like um, mismatch repair, BRAF or BRCA are rarely used, but we also have some patients with such tests. And based on the, these tests, we have uh, amount of patients that are treated with different drugs accordingly to the molecular tests. As you see on the slide, most of the patients are from lung cancer, more than 50 patients, also colon cancer patients with over 50 patients with EGFR inhibitors, breast cancer with anti therapies also are treated uh, a lot of patients. For the other disease localizations, we have a small amount of patients, but uh, also some of them received target therapy and precision medicine. The second important topic of my talk is about liquid biopsies. They are very important for um, diagnosis and treatment of the cancer patients. We can use circulated tumor cells and circulated tumor DNA. So, circulated tumor cells can be dormant or can spread to the new metastatic sites, so they are important. We can use them as prognostic biomarkers. There are several studies for this application. Also, we can measure the response of therapy or minimal residual disease, which is very important about the exact treatment of our patients. The other uh, assay is about circulated tumor DNA. We can use it as a 
real time bio bio biomarker, and we can use it to monitor genomic alteration. Now I can present uh, a case. This is 66 years old female. She was diagnosed five years ago with, with rectal carcinoma. At this time, she underwent surgery and radiotherapy and continuous surveillance until February this year. PET CT discovered two lung metastases with no other lesions. On the next month, the patient underwent left lobectomy and there was no evidence of disease. And at this point, it was done test for CTC. We discovered a very low number of vital tumor cells and we decided to have a short chemotherapy, only three months, six cycle of chemotherapy. And after that patient uh, was surveillance with the uh, all assays, uh, CT, CT scan, PET CT scan, uh, until now, she has no evidence of disease. This is example how using uh, CTC we, uh, help us to reduce duration of the chemotherapy and uh, to remain good quality of life of the, of the patient. About liquid biopsies, I can have some pro and cons. The pro, uh, the both assays can reflect tumor heterogeneity. This is real-time analysis, which is very important to, uh, for patient who is treated with several lines of therapy. Also, this is a minim minimally invasive procedures and it can be used for prognosis, response, and minimal residual disease. And some cons or maybe obstacles, the cost is a very important issue, especially in our country. Not uh, every patient can afford this uh, assay. Also, uh, interpretation of results is very important, which laboratory is doing the test. Some of the tests need, needed broader clinical validation. And important is that negative blood biopsy doesn't mean that we don't have mutation at all. So thank you for your attention. I can answer some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ilyev. Uh, uh, really, uh, I think it's... Um, uh, as you mentioned, every approach uh, has uh, its pros and cons, and the exact uh, uh, time point uh, where it's uh, suitable. Uh, uh, I'm curious to know uh, uh, for liquid biopsies, uh, uh, let's say how uh, how deep has this approach because it's relatively new so to say uh, at least here in bulgaria how deep uh, uh, do you uh, do you see that this approach uh, is being used here routinely in our country it's not used routinely uh, in our center we have only few patients maybe five to ten patients so it's a very small number of the patients can use this approach first it's uh, paid from the patient for the most of the uh, tests. Uh, second, uh, we don't have uh, um, reimbursement for some drugs when the tests are done on liquid biopsy and not on the tissue biopsy. This also um, have some uh, problems with the reimbursement for drugs for uh, such patients. And uh, maybe not all patients uh, belief on such approach. So in total, only 1% maybe of the patient can uh, use and receive uh, therapy according to the liquid biopsy. Thank you very much for, for the answer, Dr. Ilya. Uh, so, can I can I shoot a question? Sorry, I just uh, didn't understand. So, based on what criteria quickly. do you? Yeah. Yes, but based on what criteria do you offer this to the patients at all? I mean, is it do you have some 
indication do you use some indications where, where you have some indications that ct dna screen or cdc screen can help yes uh, about ct dna tests uh, we most often use about difficult to treat cases where mm -hmm. uh, there are no other active treatment options it's very important for such patients uh, about ctc uh, we can we have some data about predictive role of CTC, so we can use them as a marker for um, risk of relapse and as in uh, the case in the presentation uh, to accurately uh, decide what was the um, uh, prolongation of therapy, three cycles, six cycles or a longer duration of therapy. This is the most often cases. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I want to ask one final question, which is to uh, to Professor Christensen, and because we took our time and uh, uh, let's say the opportunity to uh, to discuss in the meantime in between the talks, uh, I fear we won't have uh, more time for uh, uh, for more discussion after that, but. Uh, I would highly appreciate if we can uh, connect to each other and continue this interesting conversation later on. So, Dr. Christensen, um, if I understand correctly, um, on one hand, uh, uh, you take, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, samples from the patients at different time points, and uh, on the other time, you monitor the disease progressions. And uh, in the meantime, you use uh, computational methods to uh, to try to predict how patient would uh, react to a certain intervention. Uh, how do you validate to which of your computational models work? If if uh, you can elaborate a bit on that. Yes, this is, of course, a very good question. So, so the ultimate validation and what we really hope to do is to uh, convince our clinical collaborators based on whose trials we do generate our data to actually generate new prospective trials based on our suggestions or based on our computer simulations, which will then show that tumors of this and this characteristica will be treated better if uh, they have... Um, um, uh, being treated in this way. Uh, of course, this takes a lot of time and it's, this is the most expensive sort of validation. In the meantime, we do some opportunistic validations by if we find a simulation which tells that this combination is better, we look whether or not there is indeed a trial about this combination. Do you hear me? I, I somehow yes. you froze and yeah. you very blurry. Ah, okay. No, no, no. I hear okay. you. I'm just listening so, very carefully. So, so, for instance, so for instance, uh, there is that one of the indications that come from the computer simulations is that doxorubicin treatment, uh, given uh, not twice a week at the doses which is given now, but giving in a more uh, monochronous way, like more uh, more frequently in smaller doses, shows in our simulations to have much better much better result to give much better results. And now we can see that there are, in fact, patients who, because of their preferences or because of their other conditions, that indeed do get the, the drug in this way. And so we can look at this data like this and see whether or not their response is, is better or not. Uh, and but this is of course a mild case of uh, suggestion, right? I mean, but even this is quite difficult to introduce because this will require that the patients will go to the hospitals twice more often, or the gauge has to be done in different way. So, for instance, in the case of doxorubicin, it indeed it it's uh, some sort of a um, um, uh, a form of a drug which is uh, in uh, lipo. Uh, so you pharmacologist people correct me, but it can be taken orally. It's not. It doesn't require uh, intravenous introduction. Right. So, so this is one case in which we can look for uh, uh, ways to sort of validate that what the computer simulation said is correct. But of course, this is only one little subcase of 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 uh, all all possibilities, right? So, so the ultimate validation would be uh, through other prospective trials. Uh, 
which uh, uh, um, should then be conducted. And you may say, oh, this is very big and very expensive and so, but if you ask the question, the existing, if you look retrospectively, all the clinical trials that exist, how were they uh, c conducted, right? I mean, they're either based on some preclinical data, which in a way never gets validated in a clinical trial, or based on some experiences uh, that oncologists have. So, so basically, I don't think that our our simulations are much worse starting option. Actually, even uh, we 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 would like to actually propose that our way would be a good way to heuristically, because clearly one cannot test all drug combinations in trials. This will be very expensive and very big, but maybe our simulations would actually point to combinations that may be hope, uh, hopefully um, useful. Then again, of course, we have all these um, um, ex vivo or, uh, you know, PDXs, these organoid cultures where we also uh, use for mechanistic validations, right? I mean, that we can see eradication of cells uh, the way we suggest uh, by the mathematical models, which is only partial, of course, because in, it's, it's sort of uh, ex vivo or ex um, as good as, as it is. But yeah. these are basically our strategies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, not only to you, but also to the other panelists and the guests. And uh, um, I have to say that we have to wrap up uh, this panel and uh, really uh, there is a lot uh, to be said. So um, I hope that we meet again, maybe on uh, one of uh, our satellite events that we will organize in the future. So with that, thank you very much once more to all the guests and I give the floor to Dr. Georgiev for, for the interview. Thank you, Valentin. Thank you to the panelists. It was uh, really, I enjoyed this uh, uh, panel because it was uh, very inspiring. Mm -hmm.